Hello and welcome back to CS420, a course on game hacking. In this section, we'll be learning about hex editing. Hex editing is mainly used for editing save files. However, the skills involved in hex editing transfer very well to resource editing, memory editing, packet editing, and those are useful techniques that we'll learn later. So there are three main steps in hex editing. First, you obviously wanna find your save file and find the information in the save file that you wanna change. Step two, use hex editing software to edit the file. And step three, boot up the game and see if it worked. Now, of course, you always wanna keep a backup of your save files before beginning this process because it's very easy to make a mistake and corrupt your save file. So let's learn how to find save files. Finding save files may seem like a trivial step, but it's actually an important skill. We will learn how to locate them quickly and reliably. Okay, first option, just Google it. There's no reason to work super hard and spend all this time and energy if the problem's already been solved. Uh, this will work almost every time, but if it doesn't, it gets a little more complex. So remember that I said you can ask the operating system to do things for you. We learned that you can ask the operating system to modify a game, and that's how memory editing works. Well, if a program accesses a file on the computer, like a game saves the save file, it needs to ask the operating system first. It turns out that you can intercept these requests so you can use software to monitor the game and see what file it's saved to. So normally if you're writing a program or a game in C++, C Sharp, Python, or something similar, there are these functions you can call to read, write, and create files. Well, these functions eventually go all the way down to the operating system to fulfill that request. The OS is responsible for actually making sure those files get created on the hard drive. Using special software, we can intercept these requests and figure out exactly what files the game is accessing. This technique is frequently used by security researchers for analyzing malware. As you can imagine, this is also something that game anti-cheat systems use. They can monitor calls to the OS to see if another program is trying to hack the game that they're protecting. On Windows, Process Monitor is one tool that you can use to do this, and it's developed by Microsoft. As for other operating systems, I'm not sure what the equivalent is, you'll have to Google around. As usual, I'll put a link to the tool in the description. Let's jump into a live demonstration of this tool. So here we have Squally open in the Hexus store, and we have Process Monitor open. Now there's all these events about random things going on in the system, and we don't really care about these. We wanna only show stuff that's happening in Squally. There's a couple ways to do this. There's a find utility, and you can search Squally here. Or I prefer this little arrow icon here, this scope. And you can just click on that and drag it onto a window, in this case, Squally. And now it's only showing events having to do with Squally. Now there's a lot of events here still, and you can see most of them have to do with these MP3 files. And that's because the game is streaming from this file, so it's constantly reading it. So let's exclude read, because we only care about what happens when they saved the save file, and that's gonna be a write, not a read. So we can right click on this, exclude read file, and now there's no events, cool. Go into the game, we wanna buy something, and now we have some new events, and we can see a write file and create file to this C users username app data local squally global dot sqa. So there you go. We're able to isolate the save file just by buying something in the game and using this tool. So we found our save file, great. But before we get into editing the file we found, we need to learn about strings. If you've never seen the word string before, it's a synonym for text, so we're learning about text and how it's stored in a computer. Let's go back to our current understanding of a computer program. In this case, it's technically a file and not a program, but it turns out there's a lot of similarities between the two. Everything we learned so far applies to both files and a computer program. Both are made up of bytes of information. We learned how integers are stored, but now we need to understand how strings are stored. Here is the string squally which comes from that giant stretch of green bytes. If you look at the bytes, you see there's a hex number for every letter in the word squally. So in this case, 73 represents the letter S, 71 represents the letter Q, 75 represents the letter U, and so on. 
If you remember from before, we learned that inserting bytes was not possible in memory, so we leave a bunch of zeros at the end. These zeros mean nothing, they're just extra space if we decide to add more text to our word. In programming, these zeros have a special name. They're called a null terminator. They mark the end of a string. In a previous lecture, I mentioned that programmers have to decide the memory limit of numbers in advance. Well, this is also true with text. The programmer has to decide in advance how many letters a word can have. Any unused letters are just zeros. There are, of course, exceptions to this. In hex editing, you probably won't see zeros at the end as much as in memory editing, because inserting text is okay when it comes to files. You do it all the time when you're editing a file with Notepad. Also, modern languages hide this character limit problem from the programmer. If you program in Python, C++, C Sharp, or anything modern, these languages solve the character limit problem for you. So depending on what language the game was programmed in, you may or may not see these extra zeros at the end. There may only be one zero or none at all. So there's one more important example I wanted to go over. And so I've added the word noob to this file. It's N00B. And it's important to know that the letter zero is represented by the byte 30 in hex. And this is different than the null terminators at the end. The null terminators represent nothing. There's space that we can use later but the zeros in the word noob are actually letters that we want to show, and therefore they have to be represented by something, and that something is the byte 30. And it's, a, it's important to know this distinction that the letter zero is different than nothing zero. So you may be wondering, how did we decide that 30 represents zero and 6e represents a lowercase n? It turns out there's no special reason. Humans just invented a chart to say which byte represents which alphabet character. And this chart is known as the ASCII table. So if you want to know which byte represents which letter, you can find an ASCII table. And here I've pulled one up. Uh, this is ASCIIcode.com. There's a bunch others. You can just Google ASCII table and you'll find some. I've actually modified this page quite a bit to simplify it because a lot of ASCII tables will show you more information than you need. But here you can see that 0, 0 in hex, which is also 0 in binary and decimal, represents that null terminator we were talking about. Then there's all these fancy ones we don't need to know about, these weird end start of text, doesn't matter. Um, the important ones are just the ones that come up all the time in files, things like punctuation, numbers. See here we have 30 in hex represents 0, like we learned earlier. If we scroll down, we can see that 53 in hex represents an uppercase S. And it's important to note that lowercase and uppercase are different. So 73 in hex represents a lowercase S before it was 53 for uppercase. And that's all there is to it. It's very simple, just the hex value and the corresponding letter it represents. So some of you may play games in languages other than English, so I briefly wanted to address this so you're not left confused. So there's this thing called Unicode, and Unicode is a standard that defines all of the languages that we might want to represent on a computer. And there are a few implementations of Unicode. The most popular is UTF-8 because it builds on top of ASCII, but UTF-16 is also fairly popular. There are a few others that I won't bother mentioning because they're rarely used. Here's a quick example of how these formats work. So here in the first row, we have the letter A in ASCII, which is represented by this byte here. Now, if we take that same letter, A, and encode it in UTF-8, it's exactly the same because UTF-8 is backwards compatible with ASCII. Now, if we take A and encode it in UTF-16, it now takes two bytes of data, and it's different. Now, let's look at this uh, random Japanese character. If we encode that in UTF-8, it takes up three bytes of information. And if we encode it in UTF-16, it takes up two bytes of information. So that's all you really need to know. Different encodings store characters in different ways. So in your hex editor, you have the option to show the text in different encodings. And that's all you really need to know. It won't come up very often. Now that we know how strings work, let's move on to a live example of using string searches in Squally. Earlier, we found how to find our save files. Here they are. 
we found this global.sqa file that was changed when we saved our gold in hexes. So we can take this, hit control C, control V to make a backup and grab this global.sqa file and drop it into hxd, the hex editor. First thing to note is we can change how much stuff is shown at the top here using this dropdown. And we're also going to want to open view, toolbars, data inspector. So first thing to note is we just have a sea of raw bytes, and then we also have the hex editor attempting to convert those bytes into ASCII. So we're gonna to wanna to find the gold and try and change it. So the easiest thing to do is go over to this ASCII panel here, hit Control F and type in gold. We have one match here, and if we type it again, uh, no more matches, so we can be pretty sure that this is it. So if we highlight the text here, we can see the corresponding bytes. There are no zeros afterwards because this is a file and not memory, so they don't need null terminators. And we know that there's a good chance that the actual amount of gold is stored somewhere nearby. So what we can do is assume that it's a four byte integer, because that's very common with integer numbers. So we can highlight the next four numbers and look over in the data inspector. We're gonna wanna look under int 32 for the most part. And we see that the number is two, and I'm pretty sure I had way more than two gold when I saved the game, so this number is probably not it. So let's check the next one. So I highlight the next number, and I see a 274. That sounds about right to me. That's about how much gold I had when I saved the game, so this is probably it. To verify, I'll change it to 999, hit enter, and save this file. Now, one thing to note is if I take these bytes here and copy them, and I go into calcu Windows Calculator and paste them into the hex. The decimal number here is massive, and I just wanted to quickly touch on this. Computers can store bytes in two different formats. It's like a left to right and a right to left. One is called a little endian, and the one that we're used to is called big endian. So big endian is left to right, how we would think it would be stored. It turns out in files, it's stored in little endian, uh, so it's just useful to know that the bytes here can't be read in this order. They're read backwards. So if we actually go in here and type in 03, which is just 3E7, then we'll get 999. Just a quick thing to point out, little endian, big endian, important to know the distinction. So now that we've found our gold, changed the value, and saved the save file, we're free to launch Squally. And if we hop into the game, we can go into mini games, hexus, shop, and we have 999 gold. Easy enough, it worked. The next technique we're gonna go over is a value search. And we actually know enough that we can just jump into this one. So this time we're gonna be hacking hexus again. We're gonna be changing our gold, but this time we're gonna do it a different way. Before we got lucky, we were able to search for the word gold and we found our gold but that's only because that's how the save file was set up. If I had programmed the game differently, then that wouldn't have worked. So this time instead, we're gonna do something a little more reliable. So we have the value 679. It turns out we don't really care about the hex in this case because the hex editor lets us search for decimal numbers. So we go into HXD, we have the global save file open again, and we just hit Control F, and we go to this integer number tab, we can go ahead and put in 679, and we'll leave the defaults for now. And if we do this and we hit search, we actually just land on the same spot, but we found it with a value search, and we can highlight this value, 679, right? I'll just show this again, Control F, 679. And remember here, I mentioned big and little endian. So it's defaulting to little endian, which is the backwards format, and we hit a match. And then we can go ahead and change this to some other number, save it out, and when we relaunch the game, you know exactly what will happen. We're going to have more gold. So let's just verify that here, make sure we change the right thing. And voila, we have a little bit more gold. I didn't really add much, but it is more. 
So that's value searching, pretty straightforward. Just search for the value, find it. But we've been getting pretty lucky. Our files are small and we're only getting one match. What if we wanted to search for something, but we get a lot of matches? Let's jump into what that might look like. Our goal is simple. This time we want to change our health from eight to 16 using hex editing. So I booted into the first save slot, so that's save game zero here. And I'm gonna open that up. And if we do what we did before, if I search for eight, and hit F3 to step through the matches. There's too many. This is gonna be tedious to try each one and back up the file and try the next one. And it's just this annoying trial and error process and we can do better than that. So what we do instead is we take this file, make a backup where we have eight health. So I'll call this save game zero, eight health. Now what I do is I go in game, heal up, and now I have 16 health. If I exit the game, it should save. And what we can do is go into HXD, the hex editor, go into analysis, data comparison, compare. And now we have the current save file where we have 16 health, and we can drag in the old save file where we have eight health and do a comparison on the two. Hit okay, and we can press F6 to step through the matches. So, oops, make sure they're both set to the start here because it starts from where the cursor is in both, and hit F6, and there's some data at the very beginning that has changed, hit F6 again, and this looks like the, the difference that we're looking for. If we go into our calculator here, 10 in hex is 16, and eight in hex is eight in decimal. So obviously this must be the health, and we found that quite easily. So now all we have to do is go into save game zero, here, and if we want to, we could change this to like three, or I'm sorry, zero three, just to confirm that we found it. Uh, we actually have to restart the game entirely because the game has already loaded this file. So we wanna make sure that we're booting fresh from the beginning here. Go into story mode, boot up the game. And if it's three, yep, that means we found the right value. And so we could change this to 16 or whatever we need to change it to at any point, and we have ourselves a health hack using hex editing. For some games, none of the methods we just covered will work. Let's explore why this might happen. One possibility is an inconsistent save file. When the game is saved, it might save information about an enemy and then save information about the player afterwards. However, the next time the game is saved, it might swap the order, and this depends on how the game is programmed. For most games, this sort of thing won't happen, but for some games it does. If the game does this, then the file comparison method that we just learned is useless because the data will be scrambled. If the save file is massive, then it might be hard to find a value with a value search due to too many matches. And if the programmer programmed the game a certain way, then string searches might not work at all because they might not store text in the save file. This is why hex editing is rarely used. It's too reliant on luck. You have to hope that the game saves information in a certain way that's easy to hack. There are a few things that might also stop someone from hex editing, and those are checksums and encrypted files. I'm not going to cover these now, but when I get to anti-cheating systems, I may touch on these. That's everything. Thanks for watching. As usual, if you have any questions or feedback, drop a comment below. Thank you.